my friends, and thank you for tuning in to Weird Mythic Podcast. I am Naomi, and I am back with more fairies. Does anybody else picture Mr. Crocker from Fairly Odd Parents when saying fairies? Because that's the only thing I've been thinking of since starting the Faith Oak series. <laughs> so I really hope that you think about it too, honestly. Oh man, I have had the most like like it wasn't even like a stressful day it was just like everything got pushed back a good half hour to an hour today I swear all because oh and I hope they're okay but there was a car on fire when I was trying to get onto the exit get on the freeway this morning and I'm like I could see that it was all blocked off so I was like screw that and went over to the other exit right because there's another one just a little bit up ahead and that one's also blocked off. And that's when I saw the fire. I was like, oh, so I legit turned around like twice because I panic because <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be late to work. And then I start to just have anxiety and I'm like, OK, calm down. You're not that far from work. Either way, you're like a good what hardly 10 minutes from work from whatever exit I decide to take. So I had to like calm myself down, got to work. And like I said, I was like 20 minutes late, but whatever. And then. Oh, I got into like a slight argument with somebody who I'm close to. So that was stressful. So just like that morning, I was getting the sweats from being late to work. And then I get the sweats from being all, you know, emotional and shit. And yeah, just got back home a little bit ago. I am recording way later than I would like to. <laughs> so, but I hope all of you had a good day. I hope all of you have had a good week. That is the only complaining I will be doing. Oh my gosh, I'm just happy to be recording. Calm myself down. Breathe. Just breathe. <laughs> All right. So this will be the last episode of the Fae Folk series. However, I will have like one other after this, but it's going to have more detail about the Fae world, not just like specifics on the Fae fey folk races or the different types of myths, different legends from different parts of the world. So this is going to be this is going to be more like about the whole network, like the whole network of how the fey world works because there's a whole lot about the fey world that I didn't talk about like when it comes to their day-to-day -day rules, I guess. And we just don't know about it. So I, I will dedicate a episode, the next episode on more specifics about what goes on in the Fae world and what they're allowed to do with us humans and what the rules are like, you know, if you happen to find a changeling in your baby's crib. So I'll tell, tell you all about how to get rid of that also. So that's going to be the next episode. And then, you know, I might move on to either a cryptid or I'm going to jump right into the next series. So I don't know what to do after that, but I, I got, I got like a good week to figure it out guys. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to like picture the fey world and our world. The only way I can really describe it, like just kind of put it out there is like how <laughs> muggles don't know about the wizarding world and all their rules and regulations, how they're kind of kept in the dark from all of it, but all the wizards, know about the rules on both worlds so that's what i came to find out as i continue to do the research on the fey folk so let's go ahead and without further ado let's talk about another fey this week i am talking about two fairies the first fairy i'm going to talk about is from swedish folklore and they are called the nisi or nise they are a household or farm type spirit or sprite and they like to take care of the house or the home or the farm they are known to be very short men or women and they usually wear a scarlet cap which if you know anything about scarlet caps i immediately go to red caps <laughs> that's on one of our cryptid episodes they all have to go back and listen to that anyways anytime i see like or hear of any type of fairy having a red hat i immediately think of red caps and that's not what i should think of <laughs> but anyways uh the fit the families who have the farms they claim to have their own family like nisei that's always helping the family so it's kind of like how 
the the um Cherokee Indian and the Yunwen Sundi, how they would stick with one Cherokee family also. They are also known to be a little bit short tempered. Haha, <laughs> short. <laughs> but if you give them like beer or cream or even some sugar, it should keep them happy. Uh, also, you got to remember to keep the home a little tidy so that they will also continue to keep it tidy for you. So the Nisei is more of like a household fairy, but in Swedish folklore, there's many different types of fairies, not just one. They have a few different kinds. And those are, of course, dwarves. <laughs> uh, dwarves will usually have dark hair. They have pale gray skin. They're short with very long beards. One of those type of fae that I couldn't find a lot of female dwarves, a lot of them were men. They like to live underground and they don't like the sun. They are master smiths, like blacksmiths and whatever to make swords and stuff. Uh, and they also possess magic and they can be very greedy. So they like to try and take all the gold they can, considering the swords and armor that they would make were for the gods. Another type of fae from Swedish folklore are elves, and there are two different kinds, male and female. Alva for female, alv for male. They live in the forest and meadows. They are beautiful and seductive with magic. They can be mean when they are provoked, but you don't really want to provoke them anyways if you know that they are elves. You might just be an asshole, but whatever. Elves also like sweets. If you haven't noticed, sugar, cream, and milk has been a huge thing in the fae world. I find it on majority of all the fae I do research on. Another type of fae in Swedish folklore are trolls. They hate the sound of church bells and the smell of Christians. They live in castles or under bridges in forests mountains and near water. It's a little bit of everywhere. The trolls that live in the mountains are the richer trolls and have piles of gold. The trolls that live in isolation are known to be the ones more dangerous. They are known to be huge and hairy and not that good looking like the elves are known to be. But they also like resemble humans. Some of the trolls have been known to have nine heads. They can alter their body to appear more enticing and appealing to humans, so magic. <laughs> but they also don't like the sunlight because it could turn them to stone. So yeah, Swedish fae. <laughs> but I was able to find a really cool story. So I came across a story of a Nisei who used to live on a farm and help the family that lived on that farm. So, uh, you know, he was that was his family. And he would help with all the basic farm work and household work. But he didn't always do what maybe you or I would think to be always helpful. He kind of his, had his own definition of helpfulness. This Nisei didn't like cows and preferred the horses on the farm. So he would legit take the hay from the cows and just give more hay to the horses. And if the family didn't like happen to leave gifts or treats one night, the Nisei would then take the animals and make them sick. Not like take them from the farm, but like go up to them and make them sick. Or even some people in the household would get sick. So as soon as they would put out that bowl of cream, all of a sudden their livestock got better. And so did they. The Nisei always expect like a large bowl of sour cream porridge, this specific Nisei. And he specifically liked a big pot of butter on top. One night, there was a girl who lived on the farm. And I think she was kind of like a farm hand. I didn't get too much detail. It just said a girl who lived on the farm. She put the pad of butter at the bottom of the bowl of porridge. Now, the Nisei looked at the bowl of porridge and pretty much said, oh my god, you guys fucked up. This isn't bullshit. Went out and killed the farmer's best cow. The Nisei then goes back to the, wherever they left that bowl of porridge for him to eat. And out of spite, he started eating all of the porridge. And of course, notice that at the bottom of the bowl was the pad of butter. Well, 
apparently this Nisei did feel bad, of course, because he just killed the best cow that was on the farm. So what he did is he went over to a neighboring farm and took their best cow and put it in his family's barn. <laughs> so there was a whole bunch of other stories that I found of a Nisei helping like poor farmers that the farmers would like, you're not really supposed to peek out your window when you know the Nisei are out. But of course, some of the farmers did. But what the Nisei were doing for the poor farmers is they would feed their animals at night. And those farmers that did peek, of course, after the Nisei knew that they were looking, they stopped feeding their animals at night. So they'll keep helping if you let them. Just don't don't mess with them, okay? <laughs> so the Nisei, I figure if you can give them porridge, beer, or sugar, like I mentioned earlier, they will help where they can at your house or on your farm. As I said, I'm going to talk about two fairies today because why not? <laughs> so the next fairy I'm going to talk about is from Wales, which I always like to Google map things. And from Wales to Sweden is like a day drive, like 27 hours or something. So, you know, I like to see if there's anything similar at you know, that's not a huge difference if you think about it. So there could be a lot of, you know, cross culture stuff going on. <laughs> well, anyways, this fairy from Wales is called the Tilt til sorry, <laughs> Tilt with Tag. The Tilt with Tag. And it translates to blessing of the mothers. They have a, they are tall, they have fair hair, and they definitely look like, you know, people. <laughs> Their hair can look like gold, and these tie with tag, they like to take human children for their own. However, they will leave a changeling in its place. Don't worry. Like I said earlier, I will be going over all of that in the next episode on how to see, you know, or what to do when you notice that there's a changeling in place of your baby. Tie with tag. Tie with tag. That's the ones who do it. Anywho, some of the Tylet Tag will be tall, like I said, like humans, like the Oshe, while others can be more like dwarfs. And then there's even tinier ones, kind of like the Aziza. They like to make fairy rings. So now I know exactly what type of fairy makes fairy rings because I see them constantly. They also like to live underground or they will live under or near water. They can marry and be with humans. However, they still need to follow the rules of fairies. I'll go more into that in the next episode. <laughs> I read on this this uh, site called Spooky Isles that if a human goes to the fairy realm and marries a fae, then that human cannot go back home, can't go back out to where humans are. And they might even start to forget their human family while spending time with the fae. You can see the Twilight's tag ride on horses and fairy raids or processions. They like milk pattern and they will visit your home if you leave some for them. But like I've said before, you got to also keep, keep the home clean. The Fae definitely don't like messiness. If you want to search for the Twilight Tag or up your chances of coming into contact with them, you can go to a lake or an ancient place at twilight during the summer solstice, which for those who don't know when that is, it's like June. You will be able to see the Twilight Tag in a fairy circle dancing during the summer solstice, but at twilight. I came across an American journalist. His name is Wirt Sykes, and he's known for doing research and writings on Welsh folklore. And he actually divided the Twilight Tag into five different types or races. Kind of like, come on, guys. I know it's hard to say, but it's the Cherokee one, <laughs> the Yunwe Sundi. <laughs> so, Wirt divided up the Twilight Tag into five races, and he has elves, the fairies of the mines, the household fairies, fairies in the lake and streams, and fairies in the valley and fields. Now, the fairies in the valley and fields specifically like to eat fungus and wear flowers as clothes. Cute little fuckers. <laughs> the more I read about the Twilight Tag, I noticed that they like to steal 
And I'm going to kind of put steel into some quotes because like how I said that the Nisei had a different definition of being helpful. It's the same thing with the Twilight take. It's a different definition of steel. So a lot of the stories that I read about the Twilight take taking food, kind of like the Nisei, they would care for families of you know, farmers, if they needed to, if they were poor and couldn't take care of their animals. I, as I kept like reading these stories of the fairies helping the poor farmers, I had it in my head that I don't really think it's technically helping the farmers. I think the Twilight Egg, the Nisei are going to the animals because they're starving and fairies are all about nature and animals. So even though they might be helping the humans in the long run, I really do think they're like, I'm just going to help these poor animals. <laughs> so I did find one like little story from the 18th century where a Twilight tag was actually taking money from bad rich people and giving it to poor people. So we had a little Robin Hood fairy on our hands there for a moment. <laughs> but what is even better is that when this fairy would take the human money, they would replace it with fey coins. But as soon as the person like would take it out of their pocket and try to use it, like immediately it would disappear as soon as somebody looked at it. <laughs> I came across a story called Guto Bach and the Twilight Tag. Now, Guto was a boy whose parents lost all their money in a shipwreck. And the Twilight Tag felt so bad for him and his family that they actually went up to Guto and they told him that under a very specific boulder that, the, that he should look under. Specific boulder, go to it, check it out, kid. As Guto went over there and was able to finally get underneath the boulder, he found a whole bunch of gold and silver coins. And now this story, I actually listened to somebody retell it on YouTube. And I have been posting the show notes now. So you'll see the YouTube in the show notes. This story is about Ethan the poet in the Twilight Take. Ethan was told by his mom at a very young age to never cross the boundary. This boundary was kind of like near his hometown and there was a fence you had to jump and there was a big dark wooded area. And then as you kept walking, you would get to a cave. And in that cave was the Twilight Tag. Now, Ethan was always told as a kid that the Twilight Tag always took children anyway. So he really wasn't interested in trying to find them. But of course, you know, like, some eight, 10 year olds, they'd always get curious. And one winter day, he was watching some people walk into a, the church. And this church was next to where the boundary started. And Ephron was like, or Ephon, sorry, was like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and jump this fence. He got just a good burst of courage and said, whatever, I'm going to see what's over there. So he did. And he went through the woods and he eventually found the cave. And what he saw in the cave was the fey folk, the Twilight Tag. He saw two small ones and two tall ones. And the fey folk must have been celebrating something because Ephon saw multiple tables of some like what was described as just an awesome food, awesome feast. Everything was ready to go. And Ephron, of course, was like, oh, wow. And then the two small fae started to circle him and run around him. And as they got closer, one of the fae leaned him and kissed him on the cheek. <laughs> so he played with the two small fae and ate their food. And the two tall fae started just talking to him. And one of the taller ones, he said that he was from Scotland. And the other tall fay, she said that she was from the Mediterranean. Ephron, being a little 18-year-old boy, just playing around the table, eating good food, all of a sudden just was like, you know what? I do need to go home. It's getting dark. So the two small fay were like, oh, you shouldn't go. You should stay. And Ephron, being a good kid, was like, no, I need to go home. So the two small fay were like, okay, well, how about you come by tomorrow? And he's like, yeah, I could come by after school. No problem. So for like 
weeks, Efron was going to meet the Fae after school. And he started to kind of fall in love with the little small female one. And he noticed that the weather was changing. And one day after school, he went to go meet his Fae friends. And as he got through the woods and got to the cave, there was nobody there. And Efron just kind of started out just moving on with his life, you know? And he didn't really start to remember the Fae. He legit kind of started to forget about them fairly quickly. But it was after World War I, like, I think it was like at the end of World War I. And he was, I can't remember exactly what he, his position was in the war, but he was in a small town somewhere. And he went around to some of the local farms and was asking the owners, like, hey, I want to, like, put some food together. I want to welcome the soldiers back because this sounded like it was a place near the end of World War I that there was a lot of foot traffic, a lot of soldiers coming in. And Efron really wanted to do something to welcome them home. And whatever he told these farmers fucking worked because he was able to get hella food from different types of farmers. And it sounded like the, the way it was described was a feast. But really, the more I thought about it, I was like, this sounds more like not just a place where you can get food, but it sounds kind of like a farmer's market. So one day, this old woman came up to him and asked if she could possibly sell her trinkets while the market was going on. Efron was more than happy to let her join. So he did. And apparently she did really well. So she sold a whole lot of her trinkets, whatever they were. The entire time, she would tell stories to the soldiers as they came by, and sometimes she would even have a younger woman with her. It wasn't every day that this other woman was with her, but sometimes she was there. And one night, Efron had enough food for all three of them, and he was, you know, becoming friends with the older woman and seeing her every day, and went up to them and gave them each a plate of food, and they're sitting down, and they're just talking. And the old woman starts to tell him of how she's been everywhere in the world. She's traveled everywhere and she knows every single language in Europe. Efron, something clicked in him and he goes, you know, you don't speak every language in Europe. You can't speak at all. And she's like, well, tell me which one can I not speak? And he's like, the Fey language. Well, guess what happened as soon as he said that? This old woman immediately spoke it. And that sparked something in Efron where he's like, I've heard this before. This is exactly what the, the older two are saying. Like the whole thing when you hear, sorry, explain a little. So even though the Fae have a different language, somehow we know what they're saying without really knowing how to speak it. It's more of a feeling that we'll get from whatever words they're saying. And that's exactly what Efron was now feeling again. And then the younger woman spoke and as she was speaking she tells him that i remember you i remember you when you were a boy it starts to remind him of them playing around and the other two fae being there and Ephron, of course didn't believe it at first but she kept talking there's no reason for him to be like how do you even know like how does how does this woman know this and yeah, it all just came back to him and they're, they're sitting there talking about everything, all the places they've been. And both of these Fey women wanted Efron to stay with them and travel the world. Efron really wanted to do this. He, he wanted to know more and obviously they felt connected to him as well. And Efron just couldn't do it though. He had to go home. The war was, you know, over. He needed to be with his mom. And unfortunately, he never saw the Fey again. And started to forget about them up until he was about in his 80s, I guess. And he he did uh, write a whole bunch about the Twilight Tag and, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> but once he got into his 80s, he, he started to remember different fragments of the Fae folk and tell his children and grandchildren. And that's when he started really writing down, too. So it was a really interesting story. I hope you enjoyed it. So remember how I mentioned that American journalist, uh, Wirt Sykes, who divided the Twilight Tag into five different types of races, the ones in the valley, the fairies of the lake, the household fairies, the fairies in the mines, and the elves. 
Well, he found a Welsh folklore story back in the 1880s. And this is directly from him. Uh, the name of this book is called British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy, Mythology, Legends, Tradition. I know, it's a lot. <laughs> but this is a story of a teenage Welsh girl named Shuey. Now, Shuey was a beautiful girl. She was tall, with skin like ivory, dark black curly hair, and eyes like velvet. And damn, come on. <laughs> but her dad was a poor farmer, and she had to always milk the cows. And as she would be out in the pasture, sometimes she would get a little bit like ditzy is the only way I could describe it. <laughs> Because people would see her just picking flowers or chasing bugs. And I mean, come on, she's a teenager. She's good. Like, I think they said she was like 17, but it sounded like she might have been a little younger. But teenagers will neglect their chores. But one night, Shuey never came home. And she never put the cows back in like their pasture. And she, let alone, didn't even milk them. Shuey eventually did come home that night, but her mom was pissed started scolding her. You know, what were you doing? Where did you go? The fucking cows need to be milked. You know how much pain they're in. Oh my gosh. So Shuey, of course, was like, I, I, I was with the Twilight Tag. And her mom did ex didn't exactly buy this, of course. <laughs> but there was always legends going around this town that they were in that the Twilight Tag and the Fae have been seen in the woods and meadows. Shuey didn't say much about the Twilight tag to her mom, but eventually she did just kind of come out and let her know what she saw and she experienced. And what she saw were these little men in green coats. They started to dance around her and they had these little tiny harps and they were singing in this beautiful language and they were talking to her. And even though Shuey didn't speak the language, she knew what they were saying. Like she, you know, like I said, she had an understanding of what they were saying. So of course she started dancing around with them. It was great. She had a great time. Well, her mom like didn't bug her after that and everything was fine. But then again, one night, Shuey just didn't come home. The cows were out, didn't come home, no sign of her. Except this time, her mom got the town people to get together. Her family, her friends, everybody went out and searched for Shuey that night. They couldn't find her. She was never seen again after that. But of course, like in all small towns, there will be rumors. These rumors were specific that Shuey had been seen in a very big city in a foreign country, specifically Paris or London. So, and it's all because she was with the Fae folk, the Twilight Tag. <laughs> Something that I really couldn't dive into that I want to mention about the Twilight Tag is that there are some stories or tradition that say that the Twilight Tag are pixies and fey folk, but that their souls are actually like reincarnations of ancient heathens or of ancient people. That they could actually be the spirits of druids. Think about this way before Christ was introduced into Europe. So everything before Christ, they really were, I mean, they still see fate to this day in Sweden and in Wales and Iceland and, uh, and Scotland, Scotland and Ireland. Like they, they still see these. And apparently there was, there's some sort of belief that it, I was going down a rabbit hole, but I really wanted to mention that there's this thing where they kind of believe that once Christ was introduced, that these Druids, I don't know. It, it was just like Christ wasn't introduced till way later. And there was always this belief that all the Fae were spirits of these ancient people who just were too good to go to hell. But were also, like I said, Druids and heathens. So, of course, they couldn't go to heaven either. So... Just something I wanted to just touch up on, touch on. I, I couldn't really get into it. It was a lot. So, yeah. <laughs> well, guys, I hope I didn't talk too fast through that. And I'm kind of ferried out. 
but I'm very excited to get into more of the rules and regulations of fairies because that shit's very interesting, odd, cool, and it'll give you more of like a background on why all of these fairies that I have been talking about. Shit, guys, we went on a journey from the Aziza in Africa, the Oshay in Ireland, the Apsaras from Hindu mythology, the Yunwe Justi here in the Americas from the Cherokee tribe. And then I just covered Welsh and Sweden or Wales and Sweden. So please tune in next week for me to go over the Seely and Unseely courts of the Fey world what to do if you find a change lane has taken the place of your baby and where to find the fae if you want them in your life or if you know you just kind of want to see them and whatever else i could find during this research on the fae folk and please don't forget to go to all of our social media or fuck i i always say we but i love serena i can't help it it's habit but she's there. Okay. Damn it. (laughs) Go to the social media, weird mythic podcast on Twitter, uh, weird mythic podcast, Instagram, weird mythic podcast, on YouTube, please send me any story or encounter on the Fey folk or any specific story you want me to cover a specific cryptid. Maybe, you know, I want to kind of gear up for a UFO thing, specifically UFOs, not abductions or anything but ufo specifically um so if you got any sort of odd story or a ghost story or haunted send it to weird mythic podcast at gmail.com guys i've had so much fun with this fairy stuff and i hope you did too bye <laughs>